now it's being recorded. So thank you all for, uh, for joining us tonight. Before we start, uh, QMWS would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians on the land on which we meet. So here in Brisbane, that's the Yagara and Turbo people. And we recognize their continuing connection You've muted again. I didn't do anything. Okay, it was muted. So uh, I was just acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet, the Yagra and Turbo people, and we appreciate that these lands have always been a place of support and healing. And we pay our respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities and the elders past, present and emerging. And um, it's a bit different from what we had hoped. So we had hoped an in-person meeting uh, at United Services Club. It's back to Zoom. Uh, however, we really appreciate that we can reach so many medical women across Queensland and uh, the whole of Australia, actually. Um, we even have Victoria present here that I know, that I see, yes. And, and I think Associate Professor um, Deb Corville, was, uh, is going to be here tonight too. So we are really fortunate here in Queensland with our current COVID numbers, but our thoughts definitely go towards those affected and in lockdown in other Australian states and territories. And when you look outside of Australia with the recent earthquake in Haiti, and I think we're all very worried for the well-being and the unfolding situation of, in Afghanistan, especially for women and, and girls there, but we strive to make the next two hours enjoyable and informative. And uh, I'm really stoked you know, to have so many people here. Um, special guest, Kathy Kavanagh, our uh, National Council of Women in Queensland Bursary um, person. And uh, Sarah, Dr. Sarah Cole, our previous president, who is always here at every Zoom meeting. It's wonderful to, uh, to have you here too. Your ongoing support is really great. Um, yes, so as I mentioned, presentations will be recorded. Um, if you want to ask questions, please do it via the chat. It will be monitored. And at the end of the night, we would like to take... It muted again. Yeah, I don't know why it starts, why it mutes all the time. Um, Anyway, um, so we will make a screenshot at the end of the, of the evening. You will be asked beforehand again. And if you don't want to participate, please mute yourself or you can leave the, the session a bit uh, earlier when we ask you to, uh, to do the screenshot. We are very grateful to Eve Health, who's actually sponsoring tonight's event. And um, as always, we actually had a raffle to fundraise for the 2022 uh, QMWS NCWQ bursary. Uh, so for those bursary, uh, for the raffle details, I'll actually have to screenshot again because I want you to know the details. We have a QR code and because it takes a little while to actually um, be able to, uh, to have everything uh, set for the donations. I wanna share widely um, or, and early on, we've got great prizes, um, a perfume masterclass, photography voucher, Samantha Ogilvy voucher, artistry organic skincare, great vouchers for Medley Kangaroo Point where uh, we're actually having our Christmas um, party as well. So please, please um, join our, uh, our raffle. Um, so winners of this year's bursary have actually been announced. You'll hear more about that later on. And, you're, uh, and they are invited to a Christmas party, which I hope many of you can also, uh, also attend. So tonight we have some really great guests. Uh, we've got Professor Crystal Middledorp, Middledorp, child and youth psychiatrist and co-chair of the strategy expert group, who will update us on the brand new national children's mental health and well-being strategy. And I guess it has only become more important with the added stresses of the COVID pandemic. 
Uh, we've got our very own Dr. Hem Emily Horan. She's a QMWS committee member. She makes our beautiful newsletters. And uh, she's a young AFMW, Australian Federation of Medical Women um, member. And she will give us a short overview of the impact on COVID-19 on children and youth. She has presented at the AFMW parallel event for the United Nations Committee on the Status of Women earlier this year, together with a number of very wonderful other young AFMW members and QMWS members. And uh, we hope that the other ones will, will be presenting for you at other QMWS events as well. And with the increased pressure on the health system, we know that a gro growing number of us have really difficulty present, uh, referring patients to mental health providers, especially for children and youth. And we are really happy to have Carol Markey Dads here tonight to give us more information about the Triple P Positive Parenting Program. And information about the program will be shared after the meeting as well too with, uh, with uh, attendees. And I will now hand over to Dr. Fiona Rossiti who will introduce the speakers of our sponsors. Thanks, Sarah. So we're very privileged tonight to have Eve Health sponsoring our evening. And we're joined by Dr. Kelly Tatham and Dr. Julie Buchanan, two of the obstetricians and gynecologists from Eve Health. Um, both very experienced and mothers themselves, as I see from their bios. I guess um, the last couple of years have been very challenging for lots of people and particularly, I guess, in the field of obstetrics and gynecology. And we hope tonight we might hear a little bit about your experience, um, both of you, from what, what it's been like for patients during COVID and perhaps their effect on mental health. So we're very pleased to have you. Thanks for coming and looking forward to your presentation this evening. Thanks, thanks very much, Fiona, and thanks for uh, inviting, inviting us along and, and giving us the opportunity to sponsor this event. Um, I, I really initially thought, what do we talk about at a child um, psych, psychology um, and psychiatry talk? Um, but really for us, when I look at it, um, I think we all have a place uh, to play in mental health. And for us looking after women who are pregnant, um, then it's really important to get the mother-child bond great um, and to, to have those supports uh, during pregnancy and postpartum, really. So I'd like to really be acknowledging that critical importance of mental health reform for women and new mothers um, in order to provide that strong foundation necessary for the ongoing infant and child uh, development. As obstetricians and gynaecologists, we frequently see not only just pregnant women, but we see a large cohort of women with chronic pelvic pain. Um, we see women who are being diagnosed with cancer, recurrent pregnancy loss, difficult pregnancies and birth trauma. Um, these conditions are all really life-changing events and can have really tremendous psychological impacts on our patients. And without acknowledging this and providing that necessary and timely mental health support, these things can have really pervasive effects on, on women's and, and their children's long-term mental health. We know that women's reproductive rights are really front and centre today. Um, I often say to my young women who have pelvic pain and wondering if they have endometriosis, you know, our mums and our grandmothers unfortunately didn't talk about this and they, they were silenced um, a lot and they just had to be tough and get through it. They didn't have a say in their health and then... I think that was the grandmother, the grandmothers of this current generation. And then the mothers of this generation, I guess, started working themselves and having their own, uh, you know, their own lives and, and getting that power, some of that power back. And it's really those mothers of today, I think, that are encouraging their young girls um, to really speak up about their reproductive rights and their gynecological health. And so thankfully, we're getting young women presenting well, at least privately in the early course of their disease. Um, unfortunately, publicly because of the um, access to um, timely care, it's usually further along down the path there. Um, unfortunately though, from a day-to-day -day, um, point of view, even prior to COVID, um, there are really still very significant barriers for women in accessing mental health support that they actually need. Um, and, you know, there are multiple reasons for this. And I still think one of those reasons is mental health stigmatisation still. 
Um, people are worried. I had a lady last week that said to me, oh, I'll see a counsellor, but I definitely will not see a psychologist. I'm not crazy. You know, so there's still that ongoing stigmatisation. Um, there are incredibly long waiting lists um, to get into trained mental health professionals. And at the moment, I say to my patients, it's going to take four to six months, quite likely, to get into a psychologist. Um, there are financial and time restraints of patients. And, and, you know, yes, we can give them a mental health care plan or, we, you know, we refer back to GPs for that. They've still got to have the time to take out of work to engage in that. And I found that there is still a reluctance for patients to engage with psychology um, during, uh, during COVID-19 via telehealth, despite all of the good telehealth resources available. I think it just loses some of that personal touch. Um, so there's, there's certainly a strong need for it. There are lots of barriers. I think um, to answer your questions about how things went during COVID-19, we definitely saw a, um, a huge escalation in the amount of anxiety and worry amongst our patients. Um, they are anxious that they can't come in for appointments during lockdown. You know, just the last two, two weeks ago, everyone was very concerned that they couldn't come in for a checkup. Um, we have people that are persistently worried that their birth partners are going to be locked out of the birthing rooms or that their birthing options will be limited. Um, there are uh, implications in that their family who are interstate can't come and help with the other kids. Um, so that what happens when they go into labour, who will look after their children? Um, and so, you know, it's not only, it's not, it's not just that it's COVID-19 and they're worried about the effects on them. In fact, it's more the logistical issues that they're concerned about more than the virus, actually. Um, and then I guess throw into that the, the recent topic of vaccination. And it's been quite difficult, I think, to try and convince women to go and get vaccinated. And it has, everyone just wants to do the best that they can for their baby and keep themselves and their baby safe. But unfortunately, because of so much conflicting information, that has created another, another layer and level of anxiety. Um, I had some, a woman today who came in and said she had a vaccination and I gave her a high five for having a vaccination. But she said, actually, the reason I've come to see you is I don't think the, the baby's moved since I've had the vaccination. So, you know, people are making the jump, but are still really concerned about that. Um, so definitely a lot of mental health uh, concerns. And I think we, we did see a huge COVID baby boom, actually, um, at, the, at the start of this year. So February, March, April were really, really, really busy months. Um, and I think that, again, compounded the effects on access to mental health practitioners um, as well. Um, so, you know, COVID-19 having impacts not only on uh, mental health, but physical health as well. Um, I was going to hand over to Julie now. Uh, to talk about some of the strategies um, that I guess we have tried to employ on a day-to-day -day basis in the absence of having um, quick access to a psychologist. Um, so I'll hand over to Julie. Thanks, Kelly. Good evening, everybody. So some of the strategies that we've um, employed in this particular journey in the last sort of 12 to 18 months since the um, advent of COVID-19 well, I'd like to think that we probably do this anyway, but in general, we really have to focus on how we listen and how we talk to our patients. And our patients need to know that we are really listening in, in, in this moment. And sometimes that means setting extra time for those appointments. Um, it's important, like Kelly mentioned, and, and as I'm sure you all mentioned, that we destigmatize mental health problems so that our patients also recognize the importance of mental health on their overall health and well-being, and in the long term, the effects on, on their, their children's well-being as well. So in, in particularly in this situation, uh, you know, I really applaud their vulnerability in talking to me about this. I think it's a very special time when women do actually open up to us about this. We don't want them to tough it out. Like, like Kelly mentioned, it's, it's really common at times, not just in pregnancy, but when we're seeing young girls, for example, with chronic pelvic pain, that you're talking to them about this and quite often their mother will be present and their mother will be crying and be in tears because they say, look, no one ever listened to me. I was just told to suck it up or... I was told to keep keep moving, just, you know, you'll be fine. This is a woman's problem. We just all have to deal with it. So I think really being open with our patients is so important. 
Um, and particularly for other women, for example, women who are pregnant, who've had recurrent pregnancy loss or, or stillbirths, for example, this may actually mean weekly scans for that reassurance, weekly contact. And that's something that we also really encourage. Also, we also really focus on identifying women with mental health disorders early, um, educating regarding mental health symptoms and referring to psychology and psychiatry services early because of that particular reason that can take up to four to six, sometimes eight weeks before we can even get women in to see somebody. And so recognising that some women may have um, some issues earlier. But apart from that, I also we also look at women's family supports and other supports and to also invite them to be kept abreast of the situation if a woman will allow us to. Also encourage women to identify the stresses in their lives as well and, and what we can actually keep control of in order to make plans to decrease those stresses. Also optimising their physical health and that can be difficult, for example, in lockdown. However, people are quite resourceful now as far as accessing exercise classes and, and um, mindfulness uh, online now, but as well as the cessation of smoking, recreational drug use and, and encouraging a moderate intake of alcohol and no alcohol in pregnancy. And again, for those families who are in, in lockdown or working from home, this can be quite difficult at times. So I think it's important to keep open communication with that. Also encouraging physical activity to keep that at, at moderate levels. And for some women, that means actually toning down their level of exercise. It's, it's so good for mental health to keep moving as, as, we all, as we all know, but sometimes women do take it to the extreme. And sometimes it's hard to get women up, up from the couch. And, and in particular, one of our um, psychology colleagues would say to women, you know, when you get up in the morning, put your active gear on, put your shoes on, anticipate that you're going to be doing something active today. And uh, I personally try and um, keep that in mind as, uh, for myself at times as well. With the plethora of uh, online resources, there's just some fantastic resources for things like um, uh, mental health in uh, pregnancy, such as COPE, Panda, Gidget and Beyond Blue. And this is fantastic uh, patient education resources, as well as MindSpot, which is good for pain education. We're pretty good at providing birth and parenting preparation, uh, sorry, birth preparation, such as antenatal classes, but we recognise um, at Eve Health, it's so important to continue that education and encouraging um, parents to access information on what it is to be a parent. As, as you know, and, and for those of us who do have kids, we do tend to focus so much on what it is to be pregnant and um, the delivery, but we don't sometimes think very much about what happens after the baby's born. And I think most of us will agree that that's when the hardest time starts. And so those sorts of resources and classes can be really important. For some of our patients, it's so, so um, important for them to have access to a midwife or our gynaecology nurse to uh, be able to contact when they need, particularly those women who have had recurrent pregnancy loss, for example, having access to a midwife that they can talk to. Research has shown that tender loving care, as, it, as it's called, can be really beneficial for women. Um, and that has shown to uh, help women have successful pregnancies. Um, and also from our point of view, it's so important to refer back to GPs as the cornerstone of, of women's health, uh, noting that a lot, of, a lot of GPs have qualifications in, in mental health counselling, for, for example, and that's so beneficial for women who are having access getting into psychology services and important for us, as, as I'm sure you will all agree, to keep communicating with our GP colleagues to keep them abreast of the situation and with the changes in our patients so that we really work as a team for our patients. And we've, if, if we can follow some of those strategies for our women, I think that can be just so beneficial in most situations, but particularly in our antenatal mental health. So thank you. Thank you, Julie and Kelly for that great presentation. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Emily Horan. So she's a junior doctor currently working as a senior house officer at the Princess Alexandra Hospital. She holds a Bachelor of Biomedical Science, Bachelor of Medical Studies and a Doctor of Medicine from Bond University and is currently completing a Master's of Public Health and Tropical Medicine from James Cook University. She has experience working in plastic and reconstructive surgery, dermatology and in emergency and rural health. 
who is an active member on the Queensland Medical Women's Society and the Young Australian Federation of Medical Women. Um, please make her welcome. Thanks, Jessie. And thank you, Ira and the QMWS for inviting me to speak this evening. I'd originally presented on this topic at the United Nations 65th session of the Commission on the Status of Women as part of the AFMW's parallel event, which was excellent. Um, so the COVID-19 pandemic, it's had an enormous impact on the world, both directly from the infection itself, but from also from restrictions that have attempted to contain and slow down the spread of the virus. These effects have changed daily life in all aspects, disrupting routine, working and schooling from home, high rates of unemployment, social distancing, missing significant life events, and loss of security and safety for some. This has led to many children and young people feeling isolated and vulnerable. Children make up a large population of the world with an estimated of 4.7 million children aged zero to 14 living in Australia in 2018. And whilst children and young people have lower rates of the infection than adults, the impact that the pandemic has had on their development, their social, emotional and mental well-being has been substantial. There isn't yet extensive literature on the impact of the pandemic on children and young people. However, anecdotal observations and research from previous pandemics can help us to identify and to respond to this population's needs to prevent the negative impact on children's growth and also to promote positive development. Children infected with COVID-19 range in severity from being asymptomatic to severely ill requiring hospitalisation, intensive care, ventilation, and even in rare cases can lead to death. Fear and anxiety often occur in relation to contracting and spreading the virus, but also from dealing with family and friends who are infected or have died as a result of COVID-19. The field of epigenetics uh, demonstrates that genetic predispositions are modified by environmental influences. And these affect adaptive behaviours, physical and mental health and learning capacities. Studies reviewing the outcomes from previous epidemics, such as H1N1 and Ebola, have demonstrated that increased rates of acute stress disorder, post-traumatic stress, anxiety and depression among children, as well as their parents and caregivers. There are certain vulnerable groups that have been identified within this population of young people and they are disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. These at-risk groups include Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children, as well as homeless and poverty-stricken youth. The pandemic risks exacerbating the already existing health, social and e economic inequities that occur between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal Australians. In 2018, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children made up 5.9% of the total child population in Australia. And this group represents more than one third of the total Indigenous population. In Australia in 2016, there are around 20,000 children aged zero to 14. And they were homeless, sorry, there were 20,000 children aged zero to 14 that were homeless. And they were either with their families or on their own. Children affected by homelessness face difficulties accessing food and housing, education, healthcare, sanitation, and water availability. Family conflict and domestic violence are key drivers for homelessness in children. And the pandemic is exacerbating the issue of domestic violence with self-isolation, quarantine, and lockdown regulations, creating unsafe family and living environments, reducing interaction with mandatory reporters at school and through isolation from supportive networks. Some of the initiatives to support children and young people's development through the pandemic include the Who's Ch Children's Storybook that helped children cope with COVID-19, as well as the COVID-19 Parental Resources Kit through the CDC. And these are available online. Accessibility to accurate and age appropriate information should be a priority in order to offset the misinformation that they're often exposed and vulnerable to through things like social media. 
Childhood is an important time for growth and development, and the current generation of children and young people are likely to experience the negative impact of COVID-19 on their health and wellbeing for years to come. Priority must be given to provide ongoing and tailored support to this population, with particular attention to vulnerable groups. And this is to en encourage healthy development and a happy life. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Emily. Um, we are so proud of our committee members. I mean, public speaking can be daunting at any stage of our career, and it's really wonderful to see our junior colleagues rise to the occasion. Um, to thank you, Emily, we have a, a UNICEF voucher. So we've made a donation to UNICEF uh, on behalf of you for 160 bars of soap, incredibly uh, important. And um, thank you so much for your contribution of the evening. We will actually leave questions to uh, after Professor Middeldorp's presentation. And um, the, um, the title of her presentation is Time for Reform of the Mental Health System in Australia. And um, there it is. Yes. So now I finally get to say what you, all of you always, can always say is that um, Dr. Crystal Middeldorp, she's a professor of child and youth psychiatry, and uh, she is one of the better export products of the Netherlands. I finally get to say now that I did part of my psychiatry training with her uh, in this beautiful clinic called the Valerius Clinic. It's uh, just outside uh, the center of Amsterdam and it was actually built in 1910. It's got this beautiful um, stained glass uh, window, uh, but it was actually demolished in 2017 to make way for luxury apartments. And uh, Professor Middeldorp, is now, has now a conjoint position of the University of Queensland and Children's Health Queensland. In the Netherlands, she was already a renowned researcher and she has always focused on improving the identification of children that are at risk for a chronic course of their mental disorder and to develop treatment targeted at these groups to prevent an unfavorable, unfavorable course. In, 19, uh, in 2019, she was appointed by Minister Greg Hunt to co-chair the expert group of the National Children's Mental Health and Wellbeing Strategy. In 2017, she received the International Scholar Award from the Academy, American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. And I'm incredibly happy that she has agreed to take some time out of her really busy work schedule to present for us today. Thank you so much, Crystal, and I hand over to you. Thank you, uh, Ina. It's a, a great uh, honor. And uh, yeah, lovely to see those pictures uh, again. Just uh, as a minor detail, the, the building looks beautiful, but I remember walking on the first board uh, uh, during the night shift when two and three miles. Uh, uh, going from one side uh, of the corridor to the other. So it also has its uh, has a disadvantage such a uh, lovely old building in the middle of, uh, of Amsterdam. And uh, I was also thinking uh, this evening that uh, the first time I came to Brisbane, uh, I was offered this position. Uh, I had been with uh, the child psychiatrist, and then I walked out. Uh, oh, no, no, it was when. Um, the dinner started, but I just bumped into Ira because there was also the Infant Medical Women's Society uh, dinner. So uh, I'm very happy that I'm now uh, also able to uh, present some uh, of my work. So Crystal, so sorry, Crystal, that I have to interrupt you. I think we have a little problem uh, hearing you. Um, is there any way we can improve your sound quality? Is this better? Yes. I think okay. it is. Yeah, is it? Okay, excellent. Let me know if it uh, pops up uh, again. Um, so, let's see. Presentation, and then, yeah, presentation notes. So, um, the time for reform, that was already um, very clear 
that's um, far before uh, COVID. So um, the National Children's Mental Health and Wellbeing uh, Strategy uh, is definitely not the only uh, report written uh, in the last uh, two years about how to uh, improve the mental health um, of the people in uh, Australia. So there is the Productivity uh, Commission inquiry. They um, wrote a report of 1,617 uh, pages, all on uh, how to uh, improve uh, mental health. And of course, they start with why we should uh, do this. Then there was the Victorian Royal Commission. Who was Sorry, Crystal. Sorry to interrupt you again. Is there is there any way you can speak more in the in the microphone? Uh, oh, otherwise, just uh, um, is this better? Uh, is something is this better? Right? Uh, well, we can hear some background. Try, try. Let's let's try it, and then I'll interrupt you again if it's not okay. Okay, yeah? good. So. Um, uh, the Victorian Royal Commission uh, uh, came out halfway this year, um, I think. Um, and yeah, there was a long list of other um, plans focusing on mental health or health in, uh, in general. And the National Children's Mental Health and Wellbeing Strategy is, uh, is one of uh, them. And that's the one I will uh, focus uh, on because um, together with um, uh, Professor Frank Overclay, I was the uh, co-chair. Uh, but I show this to show that um, there seems to be a momentum now. Uh, there seems to be this realization that um, um, something needs to be done to uh, work on this and to do this uh, reform. Um, so at least there, the the plans are, are are there or are being um, developed. So the strategy for the children um, it was actually the first uh, children's mental health and wellbeing uh, strategy for Australia. It's um, developed by the National Mental Health uh, Commission. So with uh, uh, Christine Morgan as the CEO. And then, uh, as I said, Professor Frank Overcake and I were the co-chairs. There was an expert advisory group. There was a steering group. We also uh, held two workshops, one focusing on children aged 0 to 4 and one on children aged 5 to 12 with um, several uh, experts. And then there were uh, lots of consultations with uh, key bodies, so, um, the Child Psychiatry uh, College, uh, but also the uh, College of Pediatricians. Uh, we talked with psychologists, um, OT, and mental health nurses. So lots of consultations. And then um, there was the, the draft was published in February or at the end of last year. And then until February, people had um, the opportunity to provide uh, comments and uh, did that. Um, uh, a lot. I think there were about um, one over 150 uh, responses to the uh, draft. It's almost uh, ready. Um, the last that I heard of it is that uh, it was going to be sent in the beginning of this week to the minister. So I hope that the launch will be uh, soon. Um, it's not going to be as spectacular as we hope that we would go to Canberra and then be with. Um, Minister Hunt when it's going to be launched, but um, it's um, going to happen uh, anyway. I mean, it's better that it's done now instead of waiting uh, till um, we can all travel through uh, again, because this is um, important and as already said, um, even more important than ever. So the, um, the strategy is founded in eight. Um, principle. So this one um, is a bit obvious that it's child-centered. You may really hope so with um, uh, children's mental health and well-being strategy. Other things um, are that uh, it is based on uh, strength and that uh, also relates to the fact that it's uh, not uh, diagnosis-driven but needs-based. Uh, so 
it's not that um, we argue that children shouldn't get uh, a diagnosis because sometimes diagnosis can be uh, useful, but um, the care that a child gets shouldn't be dependent on whether or not they have uh, a diagnosis. And we all know, for example, with NDAS, that it tends to be like you need to have this level of ASD and then you get funding and otherwise you don't. And that's what we mean that it should be needs based instead of uh, diagnosis based. Prevention uh, focus, so uh, try to prevent uh, mental health issues instead of uh, treating them. And um, if then uh, things occur, then early uh, intervention uh, instead of uh, just uh, further down um, the track. Um, what also is very important is that um, things should be, the care should be equitable and accessible for all. Uh, families, and that has something to do with um, where you are and finances, but also um, what's important is that it should be um, for all uh, children, also from um, culturally different uh, backgrounds. And then finally, um, it should, the strategy should be based on evidence and form of best uh, practice. So those were the um, uh, principles. And then what was also important uh, uh, to tell is that um, because we didn't want to focus on diagnosis, we proposed this uh, continuum. And you can use different um, terms for this, for this continuum, but we've chosen to go from healthy to coping to struggling to unwell. So, of course, what we hope is that children are uh, healthy and have a positive, uh, well, positive mental health and feel good. But of course, things happen, and there are periods that children are uh, coping because, yeah, um, there, um, there are some uh, some problems. And what you hope is that they cope with that, and then they um, they go back to uh, being uh, healthy. However, of course, some children um, experience more, um, more challenging events or from uh, their genetic makeup um, have issues and um, they are uh, struggling. They definitely need additional uh, support. And then there are the children that are unwell and they uh, need uh, a disorder and also um, really need additional uh, support to manage and, uh, and recover. Crystal, yeah. sorry to interrupt again. There still is some echo in the background. There was a suggestion to maybe put your volume a little bit down on the computer, and that might give a bit uh, less echoing and resonance, and that might improve the sound. <coughs> it's in your Zoom settings if you go to your microphone volume and turn your microphone volume down a touch so it's less sensitive. That's how you um, do it. Yes, but I think it means that you have to talk louder. Okay. Okay, but I can talk now then, that's no problem. Um, okay, yeah, so um, what, what's also important to uh, mention is that um, so most of the children who will get, uh, who are in the category and well will get a diagnosis, but you can also be in another category while you are having a diagnosis. So, you are recognized with an issue and then um, with the right support, you can go from unwell to coping and then in other um, periods in your life, you can go back. So that's why it's also, um, we emphasize the word continuum. So you can go from one side to the other and, um, will, and you will do, go from one side to the other uh, during your uh, life. So the objectives um, are uh, quite uh, huge. I mean, as we all know, uh, the gaps weren't uh, difficult uh, 
uh, to find, but that's not everywhere. And we've heard people say the system is, uh, is broken, so um, it wasn't uh, that uh, difficult to see where uh, the needs are. And uh, this is uh, yeah, also more or less a, a continuum. So starting with the promoting well-being and uh, recovery, and then so this is more in the prevention area. And then we need to, of course, identify the children who are struggling or unwell. And if they are, if we have identified them, it's necessary that they find the right services and support, and um, and that these uh, services are also uh, accessible. And if there are more services included in the care for yourself, that we can have coordinating uh, this. And um, and then obviously children need to get evidence-based care. And finally, this care needs to be uh, there needs to be ongoing uh, improvement. So we need to keep evaluating the care we provide and then see where um, can we uh, improve. So that's how the um, this is actually the, the strategy in a uh, in a nutshell uh, with all the uh, objectives and um, what we think is uh, is necessary. And uh, I will go into a bit more detail um, about these objectives um, in a moment. This is how we divided uh, the strategy. I mean, we need to put in some structure, and obviously, all these things are connected to each other. So you can't see family and uh, community separate from the service system or from the education uh, system. But to yeah, make it a uh, readable document, uh, this is how we uh, divided um, the chapters and, um, and the focus. Tonight, I won't talk so much about the education uh, setting, um, so, but I will go into what we have recommended for family and community, for the service system, and for evidence and uh, evaluation. So, um, the focus area one, as I said, was uh, family and, uh, and community. And this is, has already been said this evening that uh, to support families well, it's important to start um, early. So, uh, hearing and uh, need to be and, uh, provide the right support for the families to um, um, optimize the children's development from uh, early on. And then when children um, grow older, it remains important to provide support to parents and to offer them um, the option to participate in parenting uh, programs. And the idea was that we offer it to all families, then uh, all families can uh, benefit uh, from this. And it doesn't, um, it, it's not stigmatizing anymore to participate in parenting program is just part of oh this is what we all do and it's not like oh uh, you need to go because there's something with your child it almost implies because you think that um, there's something wrong with your parenting which is not the case that's not why parenting programs uh, have been uh, designed the whole idea of parenting programs is to support parents in uh, um, supporting their uh, children and not uh, assuming that they are not doing right, but just assuming that it can be sometimes difficult to uh, support a child and just providing with extra food. But um, it can be perceived by parents as a uh, it's a parent, they apparently think it's my fault. And if we just provide it to everybody and everybody can learn from it, then we take uh, away that, uh, that stigma. What's also important is that um, people get increased uh, mental health literacy. And uh, that's not easy because there is a lot out there on the, uh, on the internet um, around parenting, around uh, children, but it's difficult for parents to see what are the, the right uh, resources and, and what's the, the truth so to say, so um, that's also something that's important uh, to focus on. 
and then um, the purchase by the uh, community uh, to support the uh, community. So this is not about um, mental health uh, services in the community, but more centers where people can, can come and have basic uh, support more from a prevention um, purpose than from uh, when there are already issues. Then with the focus area two, and I will go um, into um, a bit more detail with, uh, with this focus area. So we all know that the system is very uh, complex and that um, it's hard for professionals to navigate uh, the system, let alone for uh, families who are under uh, stress. And um, I mean, we all know that um, sometimes children get referred to several services just because of the weight, but also because people are not sure which service provides what, and then uh, just refers children uh, to different services, uh, hoping that there is at least one uh, that is suitable. Um, the other issue I mentioned is the issue of the collaborative care. So, because in the um, so the service system is complex and that's also because the care is so fragmented. They did a, a mapping exercise in uh, Victoria and they found 147 types of uh, services for children with mental health issues. So the, um, the amount of services is enormous. Still we have a shortage of um, centers where people where children can get uh, treated, but um, there are a lot of organizations providing some sort of mental health uh, support, um, but yeah, we uh, just need to know uh, them. And then, so that's also about the collaborative care that these people need to work together. And, um, and sometimes, uh, Children have a report from an OT, they have a report from a psychologist, they have a report from a speech uh, psychologist, but they don't have uh, somebody who's looking at all these reports together and providing a comprehensive overview of what's going on uh, with their uh, child. And for some children, it can be perfectly fine to only go to an OT and have um, an assessment there and get treatment, but for the more complex uh, children, they need all these assessments, but then there also needs to be somebody who brings everything uh, together. The other issue is access and, uh, and equity, and that's also, as we all know, a major uh, issue. With the public uh, system, when you want to go to the child and youth mental health uh, service, you need to be uh, your issues need to be complex and severe, otherwise you don't meet uh, the threshold and you are referred onwards. Uh, when you go to child development uh, service, and, um, there is not so much a, a threshold, there's a bit of a threshold, but not so much, but there is a year long uh, wait before you see uh, a, um, a doctor, unless again, uh, there is um, an issue that needs a food uh, care for the access is, is difficult and and then there is the issue of the equity because if you have money you can go to the private uh, system and sometimes can get help um, a bit uh, quicker but at the moment since COVID actually also pretty uh, difficult to um, find help in the private system but it used to be that if you had the money it was easier to get access and at least for children with the milder uh, symptoms because they they will never get into um, the public child and youth mental health services they always need to go private so if parents don't have the funding even with the uh, mental health care plan they um, it's not affordable so these children will not um, uh, get the help until they um, meet the criteria for kids and uh, that actually could be provided help earlier. Um, and there should be, for the children who are complex, a better, um, 
type of services we uh, are purchasing and that, and that also relates to the democracy uh, plan. And then finally, of course, which was also mentioned over and over again in the um, productivity commission, there needs to be a skilled uh, workforce. So about these, um, the service system and how to um, change it and make it easier to navigate and also uh, easier accessible. What we propose is to have uh, sites in uh, both uh, urban and rural areas where you have services with integrated child and uh, family care, where you have multidisciplinary uh, teams assessing uh, children and uh, also providing uh, treatment for children uh, between uh, 0 to 12. And when it comes to uh, providing uh, treatment, it's not um, that all uh, centers need to provide everything, but they need to um, collaborate with each other. So for example, if it's um, providing a group for children with autism spectrum disorders that may be provided at one center and then maybe another center you provide treatment for children with uh, trauma because that's more specialized. And then the treatment for uh, children with mild anxiety symptoms that may be provided in all centers because that's rather common and um, will um, there will be enough children in each center for a therapist to uh, provide them. So that's the idea, and um, that's also picked up in the uh, budget, um, the federal budget and the budget of So um, with that model of integrated uh, child and family care, it's partly based on the holistic approach already taken by the uh, HL for the uh, indigenous uh, people. Um, as I said, the idea is that um, it should be multidisciplinary uh, team. So that idea of um, children can get multiple assessments, but then they are brought uh, together. It can be face to face, but also uh, online, which is uh, good for the rural and remote uh, areas. And the idea is that um, the threshold is uh, is low, so um, children do need or families do need a uh, a referral. Uh, but that's uh, from a GP. Uh, but there are no further um, thresholds regarding severity of symptoms like uh, there are there are right now. And um, it's also important that we think it also should include a parental assessment, not a thorough assessment, but um, uh, a screening around uh, parental mental health and if necessary also some support for that parental um, mental health. And this is what I uh, already said that um, treatment uh, can also include specialized programs for what will be available to a limited number of children. And um, what's important is, as I said, there are already so many services. So we don't want to uh, advise adding services to what's already out there especially in the urban areas, what we think is that these services should um, emerge from the services that are already uh, there, so, um, so that there are less uh, silos and that there is uh, more integration of services in a better and an easier to navigate uh, system. So that was about the service system and then um, some uh, more words around evidence on uh, evaluation. And this is all, sounds all like, yes, of course, we need to do it, provide services and programs that are proven to be effective, and also that are implemented with high uh, fidelity. And uh, I think the, the first two things, that's something that uh, does happen, but the um, ongoing feedback loop, I think that's often uh, what's missing, to keep evaluating your service and See where can we improve um, the treatment uh, we have. And I just give a small example from uh, research that I did in the community child and youth mental health service and how easy, relatively easy it is to already get um, useful information uh, from 
um, assess some uh, symptoms for. So this is the idea with the feedback loop. We start from the start with um, embedding the evaluation uh, in your um, service design, and then you improve your treatment based on that uh, evaluation. And then you evaluate your improved treatment, and then you uh, start it uh, again and you uh, are probably never ready. So uh, this will be um, uh, a case in no delay. So this is an uh, example. So within, uh, since we look at data from uh, 2013 to 2018, and um, uh, uh, looked at the routine outcome measures. So this, uh, these are questionnaires in the NOSCA and the SEQ. These are, um, um, this is clinician rated and this is uh, parent rated. And then there's the C rest, which is a four on um, the uh, child functioning. And um, with the C it's the, the higher the score, the better. So you see that it's improved. With the other scores, it's the lower, uh, the better. So here we also see a very clear improvement over time in children treated uh, in uh, in twins. So that's uh, first case, and um, the effect sizes are also large um, for the people who know a little bit about statistics. Um, the effect size is 0.9 standard deviation, which is a large uh, effect size. So. Um, if you do the trial and you find that your new treatment has an effect size of 0.9, you are very uh, happy. So this is, uh, this seems good news. The caveat is that the scores are still in the clinical range. So these children start extremely high, they improve substantial, and then they uh, still score high, but not as high as they did uh, when they uh, started. But this is still worrisome because that means that they are still having symptoms and that means that um, they are still at risk for persistence and having um, chronic uh, issues or relapse of, uh, of their uh, disease. So, um, and there may be multiple um, explanations uh, for, uh, for this. This is in uh, no means meant as um, that um, clinicians uh, are not doing a great job because this is actually very, very good. It's just something that um, um, to think about how, what do we do with the children that still score in the high range because we know that these children are at risk. So um, this is just an example to show that very simple data can already tell you quite a bit on um, what's going okay in your service and, or very good children uh, really improve and what's not so okay well they still score high just based on uh, on some um, questionnaire data and then of course the next step is um, who are these children and how can we do uh, better and then uh, a bit more in depth uh, research, but this is uh, already providing a good uh, idea. Very quickly um, about the federal uh, budget. So uh, fortunately, uh, we reserve uh, some money uh, for um, child and youth uh, mental health. So um, the integrated care services, they provide 54 uh, million over four years, and, and that's uh, going to be the idea that that's going to be met by the state and territory. Um, then um, around the same uh, for parenting education and support to parents and uh, carers, and also um, over a hundred uh, million to support uh, group therapy sessions and also participation of family and carers in treatment providers on the therapy sessions. Um, oh, sorry, this is uh, in the slide. Um, so the, um, the crux here is that parents can then have treatment without the child in the room. That wasn't um, uh, funded, uh, but now that's, in, that's also uh, possible. Um, and they um, reserve money to improve the uh, work 
support. Um, but that's, of course, well, the other things also take time. The thing with the workforce is to train people is not, um, not something that's readily um, done. And um, that was the overview. So thanks for your um, attention, and I'm so happy to take uh, questions. Thank you. Uh, so I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Carol Markey Dads from Positive Parenting Program. So Carol is a country director at Triple P International or TPI, the company responsible for the worldwide dissemination of Triple P, Positive Parenting Program. In this role, Carol leads the TPI business strategy development for Australia and since 2015 has led the statewide rollout of Triple P funded by the Queensland Government. She holds a master's degree in clinical psychology and is co-author of many Triple P practitioner and parent resources. Prior to joining TPI, Carol held a senior executive role, sorry, senior executive roles with the Queensland Government, leading strategic policy and implementing teams in the Department of Education. She has previously operated at private practice and published extensively about children's mental health and well-being, the influence of parenting and effective family interventions. Please welcome Carol Markey Dads from Positive Parenting Program. Thank you very much, Emily, and thank you, Ira, for the invitation and to the QMWS for having me here. Um, I think it's really after listening to everybody else's presentation and, and I was Thank you so much for all your work that you've done, um, Christelle, on the um, national strategy. It's fantastic. We love the eight principles and do think that Triple P has strong alignment um, with, with, that, um, with those principles. And we're really thrilled to see family and community as the number one focus or the first chapter in, in that um, national strategy. So thank you to all the um, professionals and expertise that's gone into um, developing that. And I, today, tonight, I just want to talk to you really briefly about what's on offer in Queensland with the Triple P program, because we are a little bit more fortunate up here in terms of the state government's investment in some um, high quality online and practitioner um, support programs. Um, so I'll just share my screen. Okay. So just to add a... I heard, I guess, in terms of preparation for tonight that not um, everybody within this um, group was aware of the support that's available through um, Triple P in Queensland as a result of Queensland government funding. So our organisation is the dissemination arm of the Triple P program. So Triple P is um, owned and developed and researched through the University of Queensland. And then our organization, TPI, is responsible for the dissemination, which is, so we're essentially a professional development organization. So we provide the professional development um, courses, implementation support and resources for practitioners to be able to deliver the evidence-based programs with families. We also have um, direct-to-parent online programs. So in terms of what's happening now in Queensland and what's been available since 2015 is free professional development for any practitioners who provide free parenting and family support to families. So whether that's a GP using bulk billing or psychologists using the, the mental health plans or generally it's through child health services um, and NGOs that are funded probably through the feds, through Department of Social Services to provide support. I did want to just note that we do have one of our professional development courses accredited with the Royal Australian College of GPs, and that may be of benefit to some of your members. So as a result of us being able to provide this training across the state, parents with children aged under 16 can access free Triple P support. And that support's available in a whole host of ways. And the aim being that families can choose the, the way to, to, to tap in, I guess, and get the support in the way that suits them. So whether that's working one-on-one -on -one in a brief um, consultation process or working in groups or de developing um, seminars or accessing online programs. So there's the website there for if parents um, basically Google Triple P 
that's the landing page they'll find for Queensland with all the information about how they can find support. So in the last six years, we have trained um, 1,779 practitioners, have access training courses, and 86% of them go on and complete the accreditation process. So there's a, an initial training course, uh, a few weeks break for them to, I guess, get more familiar with the, what they've heard in the workshop and to practice that and to demonstrate their competence. So we aim for 85%. So we're just um, sitting above that. And we've reached over half a million parents now have access to P in some way or format, might just be one consultation or one seminar, um, but in that last six years. But what's really interesting is the growth in our online courses and programs. So nearly 80,000 parents are accessing um, support and quite intensive support, like a multi-week program um, via online. So if you're just in terms of a snapshot of the Triple P system, I guess it started off as a program, but it's grown over the years. Um, so it's around 35 years old now. Um, and there's, it's a multi-level program ranging from level one um, universal communication messaging up to much more intensive family intervention, which you know, generally clinical psychologists, psychiatrists, social workers would be delivering at level fours and five in the in the system. I've highlighted, I guess, the two levels where, which I think are most appropriate um, for this group, um, one being level three, the primary care triple P, which is the accredited GP um, course that we have. And that's about offering brief targeted, so narrow focused parenting um, support. And it's usually when a parent presents with a specific concern. So I've got a concern um, getting my children um, to eat their, their dinner or to get out the door on time or to um, have a good bedtime routine. And it's working through a specific concern that they may have. Um, whereas at the level four, it's a broad based um, parenting skills training program. And that can be used as a prevention initiative or an early intervention when children, um, new parents of say two to five year olds, or it can be used when children are demonstrating um, or evidencing some self-regulation concerns. So they have, um, they have meltdowns, they have difficulty regulating their emotions and behaviors, accepting um, limits or um, dealing with disappointment and so on. So, the level four program or triple P online um, is quite originally based on, I guess, clinical psychologists working with children who were presenting with common externalizing disorders. So disruptive behavior, ADHD, those sorts of concerns. So as I was saying, primary care, it's the brief targeted one-on-one. -on -one. We're only looking at three to four sessions, aiming to be 15 to 30 minutes um, maximum over a four to six week period. So a lot of um, our training participants for this course are child health nurses um, and educators, teachers, or um, I guess wellbeing staff working in schools who can have that brief consultation period. Um, the sessions can be in person, over the phone, or a combination. Um, I, and I guess with COVID upon us, a lot of work has been happening with um, Zoom and video um, or telehealth sort of approaches. As I said, it's really topic specific, a parent presenting with a particular concern about um, cooperation or aggressive behavior or bedtime routines, meal times. So there's over 50 different um, parenting tip sheet topics um, to help um, guide the advice that practitioners are providing to, to parents. Um, with the Triple P Online program, um, we've got two versions of that course, one specifically for parents with children aged under 12, and then another version for those with teens and tw tweens, so around 10 to 16 years of age. As I said, it's aligned with the Level 4 programs. You may be familiar with Group Triple P, which is probably one of the most commonly known versions of the parent of the program um, that came out in the 90s and was extremely popular. Um, but it's an eight week program, it's four two hour sessions. And nowadays it's very difficult for families to organize themselves and for practitioners to be able to have the capacity to have um, to set up and administer those sorts of groups. So there has definitely been a switch 
um, to families preferring to do the program in a self-directed way and, and doing it online. And the beauty with the online program is that it can be done completely independently, but it also can be done with um, practitioner support. And again, this is a way where you can have brief um, like GP based check in um, with a family in a 15 minute consultation where you're not going through all of the information in the online course, but you're checking in with them about how are they going with the program, what's working, what's not, um, and just helping to um, get them a plan, I guess, for, for work, working forward with the program each week. And, and in Queensland, we've been working with ParentLine and um, that's that the free telephone support across the state. So parents can access ParentLine counsellors to support them as they work through Triple P Online as well. So if you wanted to refer families to Triple P Online where they can get it themselves directly from our webpage, you can also um, link them into services like ParentLine who'll be able to provide telephone support. There's been a number, about seven randomised control trials now on the online program showing that it's as effective as face-to-face -face equivalent program. So as our level four standard program, while the results weren't statistically different, um, there was a slight difference. About 52% of children whose families went through the online program moved out of the clinical range on the strengths and difficulties questionnaire. Um, whereas six, around 62% moved out of the clinical range if it was face-to-face -face intervention of the same, of the same program. Um, but if we're getting over 50% moving out of the clinical range from just a self-directed online program, we're freeing up resource, the limited resources that we have in terms of mental health specialists and access to them. Um, and those families who are making their um, contact to a, um, a help service, we can get them help straight away. And for some of them, they can make significant changes in their own family's functioning and their child's um, mental health and well-being. The other program that I thought would be of particular interest to this group, it's just been released. We're trying to get it. I was working with the team um, before this call today um, to get this online. This one's going to be freely available across Queensland any moment. Um, hopefully in the next two days. Um, and it's called Fearless Triple P Online. Um, so it's specifically for parents with children aged six to 14 years of age. It's a cognitive behavioral parenting intervention specifically targeting um, children who are presenting with anxieties and worries and fears. So, and it's about working with the parents to recognize um, potentially their own anxiety um, behaviors. Um, but also to support their children to develop um, anxiety management skills and coping skills and to actually generalise those skills across um, all family members. So we do find that there is um, anxiety traits that run within um, the family group. It's an evidence-informed program in that it's based on Vanessa Cobham's work um, and she's from the University of Queensland and, and Queensland Health. I think she works with um, Christelle at times as well. Um, we haven't evaluated in the um, online format, but it's certainly been through randomized controlled trials through the face-to-face -face, um, version of the program. And that's now free in Queensland, as long as we can get it onto our um, webpage. So that will happen any moment. Um, and given the um, impact of COVID on families, anxiety and worries is certainly a growing concern, particularly among the young primary school age group. So we think that will be a really um, well-received resource. The key features of our online programs, they are self-directed. So we have a mentor, Matt Sanders, generally works through most of the programs. Um, there's video clips demonstrating how the, the techniques are being used, um, families using the strategy so they can see it. Um, and a key part of it, it's all about how to apply that information to their own particular family situation, to their own parenting and to their own children. Um, and um, for different children in the same families, different approaches um, are going to, to be developed based on um, their characteristics and um, the, the behaviours that parents are looking to encourage and the behaviours or supports that they're looking to discourage. Um, so there's a lot of activities that the um, parent can work through um, and create a personalised workbook at the end of the program. So by working through all the exercises and putting in their own unique responses, they then um, develop a, I, I guess, a self-help workbook that they can have as an ongoing resource. 
So the, the parents have access to the program for 12 months, but really it should only take eight to um, 12 weeks to work through the program if we're doing it consistently. Um, and there are some reminder strategies um, built into the program and text messaging um, to say, um, hey, how, you know, module two is waiting for you. This is what you'll cover in module two, you know, log back into your program. So um, we're constantly looking at ways of improving um, the engagement with the program and reminding families and personalising it so that families can go back in and say, it'll say, hey, Carol, um, you were talking about Brooke having concerns with um, bedtime, how's that going? So we're, lo we're looking at how we can personalise it more. I guess in terms of the benefits of online for families is there's it's immediate access. And as long as you've got stable internet, which I know can be a challenge, particularly in regional areas, um, and any device. So whether it's a tablet, a phone, desktop, laptops, um, the program will work on the, those devices. Um, we've used it with School of the Air in um, Queensland. So families um, being able to access seminars and access the program that way. We've had um, families in central Queensland where the, the school guidance officer has invited parents into the technology or computer lab. And the parents have all sat there together and worked through the program themselves online and then had like a bit of a book club event afterwards where they um, share um, some food, and, and discuss what they've done in the program and what's working for them and their family and brainstorm and so on. So there's a whole way, a range of ways in which the, the program can be used. It's being used in England through the national health system as a waitlist control strategy. So when families ring up and make an appointment to see a mental health, while they're waiting to have an assessment and to see a mental health specialist, they can be referred or directed straight to the program to start that before they um, get through the uh, mental health assessment. We're finding there are a number of parents now who would prefer to do it privately rather than attend a group. They, they want, um, I guess it's destigmatizing. They're not ready to share um, how they're coping with their um, parenting in a, um, a, a group or face-to-face -face setting. Um, we can get wide reach. Um, and it reduces the need for childcare and transport, which is really interesting because sometimes there's a concern anecdotal of, well, what sort of families are accessing an online program and will vulnerable or, or would we say disadvantaged families access the program? So in, in Queensland, we've been able to get some data on the demographics of the families that are enrolling in the program. And we have got over representation of what we, well, what the Queensland government defined as vulnerable families. So these were the statistics that we were asked to collect. So we've got a, over a third or a third have got a healthcare card, which is a good indication of low income. We would expect about a fifth of families in Queensland to have um, a healthcare card. We've got good representation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander parents. So we're looking at adults here, not the children, which is a, a lot higher percentage of adult children, uh, sorry, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children in Queensland, around 7% or so. But with adults, it's around 3.6. Really good representation of sole parents. So when we looked at that together with the healthcare card, we thought it does look like those that don't have access to childcare and those that don't have um, high incomes are finding the program really helpful or accessible for them. And we can see from some of our um, internal program data that families are logging on basically between 9 p.m. and midnight. Um, which makes sense. We've got the kids to bed finally <laughs> um, and then trying to find some time to look at how can we make that routine go smoother. And a very high proportion report that they speak a language other than English and yet they're accessing the online program. We do, we, and predominantly in English, we do have about six different language versions um, but not um, languages that are particularly prominent in Australia. Um, Arabic is growing, particularly for New South Wales and um, Victoria, um, and Spanish, um, but then it's mainly European languages. In terms of using online in a mental health context, um, I think, well, we're really pleased to see the work coming out of the national um, strategy, the national mental health strategy for children and young people, um, because we don't have enough of a workforce to support um, those that need it if we're just waiting for children and families to present with a mental health concern. 
there is a real gap for that probably three-year-olds to, to 11-year-olds. So I think when we get to 12, there has been quite a bit of investment in the last few years in initiatives like Headspace. And there's a lot of work in the first thousand or first 2000 days. But when we're getting that three to 11 year group, they really don't fit into the waitlist cr criteria for child and youth mental health services. They're not necessarily acute enough, but we know that if we intervened in that period, we would prevent them needing to go on and need um, child and youth mental health services or headspace down the track. So it's a low intensity first line treatment. Um, it can be used as a waitlist management tool, reducing practitioner burden. You might have a practitioner who is working with quite a complex family and they only need to spend 15 minutes of their one hour session looking at the parenting side um, and touching base on what the family has worked through with the online program and just tweaking it rather than having to spend the time going through all of the strategies and introduction of, of the material to families. Um, it's, it's scalable and flexible in that we can use it in a small geographical area or like in Queensland, we've got it statewide. So in this last year, we've had about 15,000 families who've accessed um, the online program. We had a small um, funding opportunity in Victoria last year, just before the big lockdown hit. So from the end of May to Christmas, 17,000 Victorian families accessed the program. So there's certainly a need and demand for it. Um, and the randomized controlled trials would show that it's very um, cost effective. So for every one family working through the one-on-one -on -one, um, equivalent um, triple P program, 17 families can access the online program for the same um, cost. So thank you. Thank you very much, so that Carol. Oh yeah. The, the, um, I just wanted to give you that sense of support out there in Queensland for more investment in online programs we're very pleased to see federal government funding commitments in the in the recent budget and so recognition of investing in universal access to parenting support including online programs and similarly victoria the royal commission and they their latest budget made a significant commitment to making um on momentum that's coming through the Productivity Commission and the National um, Mental Health Commission's work um, to keep, I guess, the focus on this cohort now, particularly that three to 11 year cohort that historically has really um, missed out in terms of being recognised as um, having key mental health um, issues and opportunity to support their mental health and wellbeing. So thank you. That's wonderful, thank you. Um, I can remember learning about the Triple P program in my first year of my undergrad degree, and it's amazing to see how much it's grown since then. So thank you for sharing.